G'day mate, 40 here. I'm pretty shocked to find out that the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders popularity came with a dark side. Who could have imagined that? After so listening to an article in Texas Monthly, 50 years of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders. Came with a dark side though, all that popularity. Tex Schramm told photographer Bob Shaw when he saw the image, a shot that would sell around a million copies and turn the cheerleaders into the country's hottest pinups. But this popularity came with a dark side. That year, after a performance in Wichita, Kansas, the cheerleaders were walking back to their bus when fans descended on them in a way they never had before. A couple of girls... Everything comes with a dark side. Power, popularity, fame, money. Happiness, connection, everything comes with the dark side. People started running, then we started running, and then the crowd was running. Tammy Barber remembered. It was our Beatles moment. We were running for our lives because these people were grabbing at us. Barber sat inside the bus as strangers pounded the sides. Wow, who would have thought that uh, you know, teasing people might, uh, might frustrate them? Might, uh, might provoke a reaction. Pretty shocking. My heart was beating so fast, and it was the first time I thought, why are people crazy? We're just us. The right. visibility. All right, well, not, uh, not too shocking. I think uh, evolution would probably explain that. He brought threats. Even Susan Mitchell couldn't manage. One night, Barbara picked up the phone in the apartment where she lived alone. Good night, Tammy, said an unfamiliar man's voice. She hung up, but he called back another night, and she was so scared she moved. Yeah, that's why women traditionally have gotten married and have had someone to protect them. A father, a brother, an uncle, a male relative, a male friend, a husband, a community. She wasn't the only one. You'll have to have an unlisted number, Mitchell instructed the cheerleaders, but often that wasn't enough. A cheerleader named Billy Mitchell once opened her eyes in the middle of the night to find a strange man standing beside her bed. She chased him out, and then she moved too. Right, so this is the price of fame. Right. It's not just uh, cheerleaders who've had to pay this price. I can't tell you the number of times that I've woken up in the middle of the night and found some attractive vixen just standing there next to me, like just wanting to use me. The Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders had become a bona fide global sensation. They starred in a hit 1979 made for TV movie. They became part of the story arc in a two part episode of The Love Boat. They only got paid $15 a game. Right, and they'd have to rehearse five nights a week for hours. <laughs> they faced off against some Cowboys football players on Family Feud. And along the way, Mitchell had the impossible task of managing these internal contradictions. She had to keep the cheerleaders safe while presenting them as endlessly available. She touted their singularity in public while quashing their egos in private. She had to control this wildfire. At the same time, she fanned the flames. Cheerleaders are... Yeah. I mean, this is how the world works. You fan the flames and try to control the fire. <laughs> That's such an apt phrasing. Right? Uh, the head of the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders is not the only one who's uh, faced this dilemma. And live streamers have these dilemmas. Famous people, actors, models, celebrities, right? They want to fan the flames and control the flames. Across the NFL started copying the Cowboys with more than 20 squads transforming seemingly overnight into sexpot dancers. Yeah, who would have thought that there could be a dark side to becoming a professional sexpot dancer? Really shocking. I would have thought it'd just be sweetness and light. Who knew that when you fan the flames of male sexual appetite that uh, could lead to 
unwanted advances in aggression and criminal behavior. Sports Illustrated called it the Great Cheerleading War of 1978. The Cowboys had become the most visible and most valuable franchise in the NFL, and a huge part of the brand was these fetching women. It was a match made in... Well, think about your average National Football League player. All the head injuries, right? All the other injuries, right? The enormous toll that playing professional football takes on people, even high school and college football. Right? People who played even high school football and tend to walk with limps, have ongoing pain. Right? The body was not, was not built to play football, tackle football. But uh, people love the game. They love the side benefits that come with being good with the game. I mean, soccer, right? It always hurt me when I had the ball. I didn't like to head the ball and it makes people dumber, right? People have lower IQs after heading a ball. And even soccer has its own CTE, you know, brain injury problems. People often die early after a lifetime playing soccer. Everything comes with a dark side. There's a price to everything. In marketing heaven, in the center of the field, Captain America, Roger Staubach. And on the sidelines, 36 Miss Americas in a famously tardy uniform. The year 1978 was also when an adult film actress by the name of Bambi Woods donned that glorious uniform, or at least an imitation of it, in a less than glorious scene. Debbie Does Dallas was a shoestring porno film whose plot so to speak, followed a young woman with the dream of cheering for a certain legendary Dallas football team. Yeah, it, uh, it became a monster hit because it taps into something primal. primal. And uh, there's often a price to tapping into that which is primal. You get primal reactions back you don't always anticipate or enjoy. Outside the New York City theater where it debuted, falsely claimed that Woods was an ex Dallas Cowgirl cheerleader. And the Cowboys, presumably incensed that the wholesome sexiness they'd pioneered had gone full frontal, sued for trademark infringement, resulting in the deliciously named lawsuit Dallas Cowboys Cheerleaders v. Pussycat Cinema. <laughs> Newspapers and TV stations devoured this saga. The Cowboys eventually won the case. But the media frenzy turned a fly-by-night skin flick into a blockbuster. In turn... <laughs> the Barbara Streisand effect, right? When Barbara Streisand tried to have a photo of her home removed from Google to spark more interest in seeing that photo. The cheerleaders doubled down on their wholesome image. They launched a line of children's clothing that included a little satin jacket <laughs> and developed a new logo of a doe-eyed cartoon girl dressed as a cheerleader and looking all of seven. Yeah, I wonder how many Orthodox Jewish women, girls, grew up to want to be Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. I don't think it'd be that many. Okay, 3.7 kilometers till we hit the Spit Bridge. Young girls had by then become a major fan base for the cheerleaders. But the sexual team... Right, right, young girls want to be, grow up to be the object of male worship and desire the squad had introduced was tricky to put back in the bottle. That same fall of 1978, five women dressed as cheerleaders posed for a feature in Playboy. So it reminds me of a Playboy story, the dark side of Playboy, that what, 12 part A&E special on, on the, the rape, the drugging and raping, uh, the use of Linda Lovelace with, with a dog. Uh, Hugh Hefner raping Dorothy Stratton Ainley. Uh, there's all sorts of horrible, horrible behavior going on in the Playboy empire while simultaneously getting really good press. Much of it was because Hugh Hefner and Playboy would have you know, videotape going on all around the Playboy mansion. So many members of the media, uh, they would be taped in compromising situations so they would then be quite reluctant to say anything publicly against Playboy. 
The group was a rogue outfit called the Texas Cowgirls, a rival Dallas-based agency formed by women who had quit the cheerleaders, fed up with the rules, worn down by the demanding schedule and low pay, or been nixed from the squad as auditions became cutthroat. The cowgirls made appearances at places where the cheerleaders wouldn't dare go, <laughs> often events where alcohol was served, and their fees were shared evenly among the members, unlike the cheerleaders, whose occasional appearance fees went to a select group of favorite members of the squad and who did not see a dime from the squad's numerous merchandising deals. The Texas Cowgirls' splashy debut in Playboy was a riff on the cheerleaders' top-selling 1977 poster, Five Glamazons and a Trump. Oh, Grotto Point Aboriginal engravings, bro. This looks pretty cool. Some amazing art. It it rivals that of Michelangelo and Monet in the, the sophistication. Unbelievable. Oh. Give me the shakes and the shivers. I mean, this is some art. You know, I don't know why people are like, so worshipful of the Sistine Chapel when they could when they could come and see like fish engravings. Wow. I mean, this is better than the Sistine Chapel. I mean, this is art that just takes your breath away. Ankle formation except for one detail. This time, their tops were untied. Oh no. Despite the controversies of the late 70s, the cheerleaders rarely encountered any sort of public backlash. But in 1982, they arrived at Fresno State University in California to rehearse for a halftime performance. And as they entered the campus, they were- Just imagine that being widely adored, public figures playing on the most primal of emotions. Right, without any backlash, right? How long do you think that can go on? Greeted by a big white bed sheet hanging out the window of a building, spray painted with the words, hearts and minds, not bumps and grinds. Powerful. The cheerleaders had transformed culture in the previous decade, but so had second wave feminism. Yeah, the cheerleaders transform culture? Seems a little exaggerated. Let's say they mildly amplified Things that were already in the culture. Ms. Magazine debuted the same year, 1972. And what a joyous bunch of people. What a fun-loving, happy, wise-cracking bunch of people like the Ms. Magazine crowd. That iconic uniform did. That is that liberalism always tends to scolding, bullying, hectoring. Like without educating, bullying, hectoring, scolding. <laughs> you wouldn't have the liberal left. Right, there's, there's no liberal left without taking on a mission to civilize the peasants, to bully and educate people. They need to wear their face masks and they need to not dead name people. They need to use the proper pronouns. A consciousness raising publication co founded by Gloria Steinem. Nothing like a good consciousness raising, right? I always associate consciousness rising, raising with good times, joy, happiness. Humor, lightheartedness, not taking yourself too seriously. I, I don't know, How, what do you associate with uh, consciousness raising? It helped popularize ideas about sexual objectification and the male gaze during... Yeah, boy, that sounds like a good time, right? Boy, nothing, nothing I like more than being educated about objectification and the male gaze. I really could do with some education and hectoring and bullying on that. Thank God for Gloria Steinem and Ms. Magazine. Decade when legal victories like Roe v. Wade and the 1974 Equal Credit Opportunity Act were changing women's lives. Oh, and changing them just for the better. Right? Nothing like the murder of millions of kids to and transform women's lives for the good. By 1982, a feminist vernacular had seeped into the American vocabulary in the same way hot pants and jiggle had seeped into network programming. Yeah, how about a middle path between the two, right? A little bit of modesty combined with femininity. Right? Traditional mores where women would have fathers, brothers, relatives, friends, communities. 
judges who would uh, encourage them to turn it down a little bit if they were going over the top.